I just want to point out it's 6 p.m. and uh, everybody starts watching Netflix around this time. So uh, if we do get in an unfortunate situation where my internet gets throttled, I do have a backup link, but somebody needs to tell me because the picture is going to become all grainy and I'm not going to know. So uh, m maybe paste something into chat or, or wave uh, and I'll be able to switch to the backup link. Um, so th thanks very much uh, for everyone who joined. Um, the thing I want to talk about today is how I lost almost all my money and uh, how you can avoid doing that. And hopefully you can learn from my mistakes. Um, so somewhere in uh, 2007, 2008, I, I became a CTO of a small startup. And back then, I thought we were, you know, the best company in the world. That's what you get with a very small company that's kind of delivering a product and everybody's excited and everybody's kind of crunching it. And the, the, the team I worked then with, technically, I, I still think is the best team I've ever worked with. So um, we had continuous delivery before the continuous delivery book came out. We had almost fully automated tests. We had daily releases. We had, you know, the works. We were even an early adopter of the cloud uh, back then. And, I, I, you know, everything was amazing, 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 amazing until the company ran out of money. And... As what kind of a, a stakeholder in the company, I decided not to take any salary very foolishly because they thought it's better to take uh, shares. And, you know, when the company ran out of money, the shares were pretty much worthless. So I, I kind of um, pushed it to the point where I had no more money to pay rent next month. And then I had to slap myself in the face and basically say this isn't really as good as I, I thought it was. And that was a big wake up moment for me. And I've, I've realized that, you know, it doesn't matter how good we are technically, if we are building the wrong thing, or if we are building something with a lot of effort and it doesn't need that effort, um, we're not that good. And, and we can't possibly be, you know, that good that we thought were good and the company runs out of money. And I, I've realized this kind of, um, several interesting things that caused us to, to run into that problem. And it was a big kind of lesson for me that I don't know how to talk to people who are product people, or I didn't know back then. And I didn't know how to challenge them enough. I didn't know how to extract the information that we really needed from people who had that information. And um, partially that's what I wanna talk about. Also, I want to show you some, or I want to give you some good tricks and techniques that you can use in everyday work, not just kind of startups that are exploding. And um, my kind of mode of working when I make a stupid mistake is to kind of do a lot of research and to try and figure out how do other people solve this problem? And how do other people figure out what's valuable to build? And how do we know that we're on track? And basically, one of the problems we had, and, and I th think is, is a major problem, is that there's two planning horizons, really. There's this planning horizon where five years from now, we're going to make trillions, or, or next year, we're going to launch a new channel, and it's going to be amazing. But there's kind of this week, we need to do this stuff. And it's very, very easy to measure value and to describe value for this kind of stuff. It's very, very difficult to measure value and describe value for this kind of stuff. And then we end up in a trap where um, running around like crazy, we, we kind of don't really deliver or map value on a big level. So when we look at value for kind of big, big ticket items like this, so it's gonna be you know six months from now, a year from now, we're typically talking about product milestones and, and um, the value is then described in stuff like double the revenue or increase the market share or launching a new market or, or something glorious like that, that needs lots and lots and lots of work to actually, uh, you know, happen. But then we have a decomposition of that stuff. And, and 
you are, you know, we're talking to an agile meetup. Most people here hopefully are working in some kind of agile team. So that means usually decomposition to user stories, decomposition to small iterations, decomposition to stuff that takes a week or two weeks to do. And then the big question is, how do we actually know that the stuff we have this week or next week, that, that it actually kind of contributes to the big goal? And that that's the smartest possible thing that we can do because it turns out that value is, is almost impossible to describe well on a short time cycle. Because I, I, I've probably never worked on a user story that doubled the revenue of a company on its own. Or a single user story that helped open a new market. Or, or you know, even five user stories together in an epic that hugely increased market share. Usually these things move things bit by bit. And um, there's this massive, massive disconnect from what we perceive to be valuable on a shorter time cycle and how that relates to a longer time cycle. And the big problem with that is this disconnect can be very, very misleading. Um, 20 years ago, when I started making money from, from software, actually now it's 22 years ago, um, the big challenge we had was figuring out these you know, massive a year cycle or six month cycles. Nobody I worked with back then delivered in less than six months. And figuring out what that actually kind of uh, should contain, must contain, will contain, and, and all these other prioritization techniques. And then kind of people have a massive negotiation. They fight, they budget. It goes into the pipeline. Three years later, gets released. Nobody wants it. It's already obsolete and everything like that. And then when, when uh, you know, Kent Beck wrote the book, um, it, it really opened my eyes and I was starting to push for stuff like that already in, in 2001, 2002 with the people I worked with. And I think what that brought to us is shorter feedback cycles and shorter feedback cycles brought a need for a much closer customer collaboration. And what we have now in our industry uh, is all these problems you know, were forgotten and people are now more or less joining the industry already having this short iterative cycle and very close customer collaboration. And I, th there's a ton of benefits to that, a ton of benefits. I'm not going to argue at all against that, but one thing we have lost is taking a bit of a kind of step back from what people are telling us they want and what we implement. In many organizations, that are having close customer collaboration today, the customer, however you define the customer, you, you know, a, a stakeholder or a, a business representative or even people we work with to kind of give us the requirements, they ended up being software designers because of this kind of close collaboration. It has some really, really negative effects because those people don't know how to design software. And because they don't know how to design software, they often ask for things that don't make sense or propose things that are not actually the best ways of solving the problem. But I see lots and lots and lots of teams today that kind of have lost the connection between the problem they're solving and all these low level instructions like we want this screen and we want these buttons and stuff like that. And I think that's a cause for massive amount of waste. And um, a friend of mine worked with a uh, medical software, medical uh, planning software company where they've done, you know, agile by the book, whatever book you take. And they had very close customer collaboration. Developers were talking to uh, the admin assistants for the doctors almost every week. They were showing them progress. The admin assistants were looking at this, approving, suggesting new ideas. They were iterating on this stuff. Um, it was amazing. It was totally wonderful. Everybody loved it until nine months later, one of the senior project sponsors said, where's my software? You promised it's going to be there in six months. Now is nine months. Where's my software? 
And then the whole discussion started how the admin assistants were changing the requirements, but because this is agile, you work with the customer to change the requirements and you know they were moving things on the screen and everybody loved the collaboration, but it took five or six attempts to get every screen done. And by the you know, end of the ninth month, they only had admin screens. They, they didn't have anything apart from admin screens because that's what the admin assistants for doctors wanted to see. And they were kind of overcomplicating that stuff with the best of intentions because they were told they need to provide the requirements. And the software people were basically just providing a taxi service. Somebody said, go left, they went left. Somebody said, go right, they went right. Ah, go in circles, that's perfectly fine, go in circles. And, and I think we need to take much, much more responsibility for, for what we're doing. And um, I started researching this a lot after kind of my, my uh, hiccup with the startup. And I realized, well, you know, there's, there's a whole body in academia where people have been researching this stuff. It's called goal-driven requirements engineering. It's incredibly complicated, but, you know, it's there. Then there's people who are actually delivering stuff well, and, and they have their own techniques. And there's a bunch of kind of um, techniques that people have published about. And I started reading about that and interviewing people um, that have done that well to figure out what I've done wrong and really going to, you know, uh, into product management much more than I wanted. And um, I'm now writing a new book with, with a colleague called Christian Haas, and we're actually collecting really good case studies of projects where you, you thought this is just going to be horrible, but it actually turned out really well. And we really, really rarely hear about that kind of stuff because usually we hear about software when it's a disaster. We don't hear about something that delivers in for a fraction of cost and uh, 10 times more value because those cases are relatively rare and they're not that exciting. It's much more exciting to you know, write about chaos. One of the most interesting books that I can strongly recommend you read is um, The Art of Business Value by a guy called Mark Schwartz. Mark was the uh, chief information officer, the IT director, for the US Immigration Services when he wrote the book. And he uh, got into the post um, during the Obama administration where they were getting ready for a huge change in some legislation and they had a few years to prepare for it. And Mark joined the org when they were kind of, I think about one and a half years in. And um, this was a massively important project. He looked at the, the kind of paperwork they've done and they've collected all the possible requirements. They had thousands of pages of requirements, but nothing actually delivered. Which is no, not exactly sounding like it's gonna be a good story. And um, what he did is he kind of figured out how do we start somewhere and actually relate these small activities to the bigger value? How do we you know, kick things off so we know where we're going with this and we know we're not getting lost? And they identified that basically the key thing from a business perspective that this thing needs to do, apart from you know, a five-year thing, passing legislation, whatever, is to allow human case workers to process more cases per day. That, that was the value thing. If they do that, they're, they're improving. If they don't do that, they're not improving. And they've kind of restarted the whole thing with that in mind. They measured the number of case work, cases a human case worker is processing per day. They published that number for people to see. And then every delivery they had, and they've done, they've done frequent deliveries, they would look very quickly after that, has the average number of cases per day increased that we can process? If yes, we're doing well. If not, what we've done is not that good. We need to go back to the table, reassess, reevaluate. Maybe we are kind of getting lost. And the, the project was officially delivered two years ahead of schedule, which is something that I've, I've never heard of for a government project in a bureaucratic organization. So kind of, Another book that's interesting and talks about the, the kind of uh, similar stories that I strongly recommend you read is Four Disciplines of Execution. Four Disciplines of Execution is um, a book about the conclusions of a research that Stephen Covey has done on 
what's the difference between companies that are incredibly good at executing their plans compared to companies that are not that good executing their plans? And if you've done, you know, if you've read the modern agile literature, if you've kind of done, read any modern product management literature, pretty much nothing in the book is going to be new to you. But I still strongly recommend you read it because they've been able to explain these things so well and, and, and so nicely that you'll get a whole vocabulary to kind of take away and use with your clients. And um, the, the key conclusion in the book and, you know, the titular four disciplines that uh, they're using as, as big differences are these four. Basically, the first one is focus on what's really important. Like, yeah, yeah, is, is that really anything new? Shouldn't that be obvious? But you see, like, you know, in my startup, we didn't. And um, in this kind of medical uh, software planning uh, company, they didn't. They kind of focused on the admin screens instead of focusing on what's really important. Um, then the second thing they talk about is how there's two types of measures that people keep tab on in projects. There are measures that tell you whether you've succeeded or failed. And those measures are only measurable when the whole thing succeeded or failed. On, on a large cycle, like market share, like profit, like revenue. Those are kind of the big, big goal items. But they say those measurements cannot help you adjust course throughout the delivery. If what you're working on is a bad user story, these measurements don't help you figure that out. It's too late to measure that six, six months later or a year later. So they said, find measures that help you figure out are you going the right direction with, with a small piece of work that you do now, the kind of leading measures, measures that help you lead the way. And then kind of the third one that is a big difference between organizations that deliver well and those that don't is to keep a compelling scoreboard, um, kind of show this information to people so they can make decisions. Don't hide it. Don't, don't just keep it on one PowerPoint somewhere on some guy's disk or you know, a, a, a metric system that nobody uses, but show it to people like Mark Schwartz did. And then the fourth one is create a cadence of accountability. What, what they mean by that is every few weeks, every few months, whatever the right cycle is, actually you know, take account of what's been done, what's been delivered, and then honestly evaluate whether what you've done that iteration or what you've done that month made any difference or not. Because if it didn't, it's probably time to go back and replan a bit. So, kind of I said, these things sound pretty obvious, but they're not. And they're not because we usually have no good way of creating leading measures. Like, we can say, oh, you know, it's important to increase revenue or market share or reduce business risk or implement GDPR. And we say, well, we're going to focus on that for the next six months. But then... This kind of second thing is what's really causing a problem. Um, a scoreboard is not really a problem and, and you know, weekly retrospectives, bi-weekly retrospectives, that's not really a problem. The second one is really a problem for most software teams. And this is a problem, again, because of how we describe value and how we capture value, how we look at value. So uh, Don Reinertsen wrote this wonderful book called uh, The Principles of Product Development Flow. Again, one of the things you definitely have to read if, if you're interested in business value. And uh, in the book, he has a very interesting statement. He says that it's really popular to say that you can ask the customer if something's valuable or not. And that the customer can be the final judge of that. But that's horribly dangerous. That's dangerous because uh, you can get misled badly and because you need to make sure that you're actually talking to the right people. And um, the customer is not some, you know, amorphic blob. And, and when you're working with an organization delivering software internally or, or externally, there's lots and lots of customers there. There are lots of stakeholders. There's lots of people who have differences in opinion. And then it's a question of who do you trust? And, and uh, this friend of mine that worked with a medical software planning thing, they actually made the mistake of, of trusting the 
administrative assistants to tell them if they're delivering value or not, instead of trying to dig deeper. And that's kind of what I think is, is um, my big lesson from, from kind of my experience with that startup is we need to be better talking to these people. These people might have the information, but they don't know how to give it to us because they don't know what we need. And they're not used to kind of, you know, designing for value. That's our job. It's not there. Their job is to be administrative assistants for doctors. And kind of then they started replanning this with thinking about, well, the whole purpose of this software is for doctors to have a better schedule, for doctors to have less gaps in the schedule, and for patients to reach a doctor sooner. So those are the two things we can measure. Those are the two things we can actually influence. Like if we release a piece of software, are we reducing the gaps in the doctor's schedule? And are we getting people to come to the doctor sooner? If yes, we're delivering value. If not, we're not delivering value. And those are things we can measure on a shorter time scale, not something we have to wait six months from now. And once they started thinking about that, it became clear that spending nine months on doing admin screens is ridiculous. Because with admin screens only, you can't even get a schedule to the doctor. You can't get a person to the doctor. We, we, you know, we, we need to slice this completely differently so we can actually deliver value. So there's a wonderful story um, about trusting people who told you that something is important to tell you whether what you delivered is valuable. And this comes from the British Broadcasting Corporation in the UK. BBC is funded by public subscription, not tax, but kind of everybody has to pay. Um, and how that's different from tax, I don't know. You know, nobody was able to explain to me why, when you have to pay some money and everybody has to pay, why, why that's not tax, but it's separate. And um, the BBC had this personalization project for their uh, video player. And they spent several years personalizing the video player until they shut the whole thing down after spending 75 million pounds. And they shut it down because it didn't deliver any value. And because the BBC is funded from public subscriptions um, or public licenses, the UK government national audit office got involved to figure out how can you possibly spend 75 million pounds without delivering any value. Like that sounds crazy. How, how were you able to do it? How were you able not to find, you know, after 10 million pounds that this is not delivering value or after a million pounds or after, you know, something smaller? And the conclusion is wonderful. I, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll send you the link. The conclusion is that they could spend so much money because the project was agile. And what that meant is that managers could make up the benefits as they went along to justify whatever they thought was a good idea. Once somebody says, do this for me, it's their idea. Of course, they're going to say it's valuable. And we have no context to challenge them. And in a sense, all they were measuring is that they were delivering a solution. They were not measuring that they're solving the problem. And those two things are completely different. So they had the wrong short-term measures. They failed on the second uh, kind of discipline of execution. Now, I, I assume because this is an, an agile audience, uh, most of you are kind of working with uh, user stories in kind of some format like this. And I'm gonna come back to this user story later. I would like you to read it very carefully. I'll give you a minute or two. And I'd like you to think about where is the value here? If I delivered payment alerts in the mobile app and you were my stakeholder, how would you measure that I've delivered value? Think about that and we'll come back to that later. So another kind of force of nature in, in IT that's working against us when we're looking at how do we measure value is uh, what Doug Hubbard in, in his book, um, How to Measure Anything, called the kind of value measurement inversion. And he later redefined it as IT measurement inversion in a blog post. I'll give you the slides later so you can look at this blog post. And he said kind of this measurement inversion he noticed is, is really very, very frequently present in IT projects. 
And the measurement inversion in, in his words is that stuff that's the most valuable to measure to see how we delivering value is, is so rarely present. That it's kind of almost inversely proportional. Stuff that has no relationship to how we delivering value is measured very often. Stuff that actually measures value is almost never measured. Um, a case in point are, are story points. Almost everybody claiming to do Agile is measuring some kind of story point metric or something like that. And story points are basically a measurement of effort. Story points are a measurement of how much effort we spent delivering something because they directly relate to the complexity of the stuff we deliver. If I'm working on a simple story, it's going to be two points. If I'm working on a complicated story, it's going to be 10 points. It's not a measure of value. It's a measure of how much complexity we put in. And then people go crazy about optimizing the number of story points. And that's basically saying we're putting more complexity into our software. That's not something we should you know, celebrate. That's cost. And, and that cost might be justified if we're delivering value. And the value is higher than the cost. But story points are basically measuring cost. So please, 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 if you're working with story points, don't ever talk about delivering story points. Talk about spending story points or investing story points or burning story points, but not about delivering story points because they don't deliver anything. So kind of, uh, we need to find better measurements and, and that's kind of key. We need to find measurements that we can use on user stories. We need to find measurements that we can measure short term and we need to find measurements that actually allow us to evaluate whether this particular thing was a good idea or not. And there we have three big problems because again, we are relying usually on other people to tell us what they want. And we need to translate that somehow to value. So the first big illusion is that what the customers request is what the customers need. And this is a big, big problem for people that have very close customer collaboration and they've lost this disconnect. There's, again, a ton of value in very close customer collaboration, but then very often the side effect is we lose this disconnect critical thinking we just trust them that whatever they told us they want, they actually want. And th there's, a, there's a wonderful um, kind of story about that from, uh, well, you know, the, the, the medical software companies, one good example. There's uh, lots and lots of examples. One, one of the things that um, really stood out for me when I was reading that, and I can send you the links for this, is what's known as the 40 Shades of Blue. 40 Shades of Blue is a famous episode at, at Google where uh, the head of design, a guy called Doug Bowman, was asking the developers to change the colors of the links on the homepage. And he was giving them different colors, uh, iterating on blue. And, and after a while, kind of the developers got a bit angry because, you know, they were changing the same thing over and over again. They said, look, um, what are you trying to do? Where's the value here? Like, can we help you? And he said, no, no, don't worry about this. This color is the best. This color is, is what we need. And he said, well, how do you know that? How do you know that we're not going to kind of, you know, restart doing colors again next week? He said, well, this color is a lot more noticeable than the color, current color. The color theory says that. And that's wonderful. And usually kind of when, when uh, somebody important has an explanation like that, well, you know, you trust the head of the design about um, a color choice and that the color is more noticeable. Um, that, that's, the, that's kind of the end of the game. No, not at Google. What the developers did that day is they tried to kind of figure out, well, what would be the consequence of this color being more noticeable? Uh, well, the consequence would be that people spot more links, they click on more links and things like that. And then that night, they ran 40 different colors of blue on production. And that's where kind of the, the, the name 40 Shades of Blue comes in. And as a result of that, depending on who you, who you ask and whose story you read, Doug either quit or got fired. And he, he wrote a really angry blog post about this, 
where he said you can't do good design at Google because you're asked to measure everything on a short cycle. Some ideas take a bit to mature and, you know, nobody trusts designers. It's an engineering-led environment and things like that. So um, there was a conference in the UK a few years later where um, somebody was presenting on how they do design and there was a question in the audience. Somebody said, well, you know, Doug wrote this story. What do you think about that? And, and the person on the stage pulls out the data and if they had adopted Doug's color and expanded it to 100% uh, percent of the usage and ran it for a year, it would not attract more clicks. It would actually uh, lose about $250 million. So here's a big question, like, what's the cost of that story? Is the cost of that story two story points or is the cost of that story $250 million you would lose? And how do we not have to wait until the end of the yearly cycle for profit to be you know, calculated to know how much money we've lost, by which time we've already done all sorts of other stories and, and you know, mixed up the, the, the effect. How do we do what kind of you know, Google did and, and identify things like that? That's a, that's a key thing to think about. And this brings me to kind of illusion number two, just because somebody important asks for something doesn't mean it's valuable. In lots of organizations, when a senior business stakeholder says, we want a new reporting system, doesn't actually mean that the new reporting system is valuable. It's not proportional to people's salaries, but for many organizations, it is. You know, the, the, we have uh, an administrative assistant for a doctor saying something, and then some kind of manager of the whole um, pyramid saying something. Of course, you trust the manager of the pyramid more, but why? I mean, how? We, we need to be able to kind of have these conversations better. And this brings me to kind of another thing where uh, at Microsoft, there was an interesting research a few years ago. A guy called Ron Kohavi went back to some PowerPoints that promised grand things and tried to measure whether for, for kind of more experimental projects, these PowerPoints actually came true or not. And his conclusion is that at Microsoft, only about one third of ideas improve the measurements they were supposed to improve. About one third had no statistically relevant impact on, on the measurement they were supposed to improve. And about one third actually damaged the numbers they were supposed to improve. They also quote Amazon in that paper. And um, at, Amazon, at Amazon, apparently the success rate is slightly below 50%. Now, what that means is, if the team you're working with now is anywhere between Microsoft and Amazon on the scale, Microsoft is not a bad software development company. They're one of the better ones. So good to great. That means that, you know, in your current backlog, maybe, you know, between a half and two thirds are bad ideas. The stuff you've delivered over the last year, maybe between a half and two thirds are bad ideas. How do we spot that stuff? How do we spot that stuff quickly so we can take it out instead of letting it there you know remain and, and cause long-term damage or just maybe not cause damage you know cost us more in testing um so kind of this brings me to you know the the, the third point we're, we're really not good at estimating the value of features we're actually very very bad at estimating the value of features and when somebody says, well, you know, this is going to be amazing, and somebody else says, no, that's going to be complete rubbish, we, we have no good way of comparing these two things and actually figuring out, are we doing it well or not? So um, there's another really interesting book I've come across uh, in, in my kind of research of this stuff. The book is called Adapt by a guy called Tim Hartford. Tim is a British economist, and he talks about why linear plans usually fail. Not in software, he doesn't have any software uh, case studies, but he talks about civil engineering, he talks about military planning, he talks about government plans, uh, large companies, and, and he says usually kind of linear plans fail because we don't control everything. Um, our users have free will. They might do or not do what we expect them to do. Our competitors are trying to undermine us as we're delivering. Uh, time moves on. And he identified three uh, important dimensions that can cause uncertainty. 
in projects. And I think it's interesting to kind of think about this because what that means is that even the best business analyst or even the best business stakeholder might be wrong occasionally because of these things that are not under our control. That might sound scary, but it might also sound liberating. And he said it's kind of locality in a sense where if you have somebody who has really, really good knowledge about one area of the business or, or one locality or one type of a device, and then you try to get that knowledge translated somewhere else, there is uncertainty there. You might get surprised. So you might have you know, people who've done amazingly good desktop apps, and then you want to migrate to mobile, and you know that causes surprises. Or you might have a company that's done really, really well in Germany. They want to launch in Poland, but the market is different. It's, it's a, you, they, they might get surprised. The other thing he talks about as a dimension is time. Stuff that was a good idea six months ago might not be a good idea now. Stuff that's an amazing idea now might have been a bad idea six months ago. Um, the longer the distance between proposing an idea, evaluating it, and, and kind of actually delivering it, the bigger the chance that something is going to get disrupted there. Because, you know, customers, because the market, because Corona, because who knows, you know. And the last dimension he talks about is, is human, where um, people who are going to use our products basically have free will. And uh, we might expect them that if we give them this color, they will click more, but maybe they will not. Maybe they, you know, there's some personal preference there that people hate this particular color, or maybe they don't want to do it that way, or maybe the color just isn't that important. And um, we need to be able to tackle with these things. Now, the bad news is that your stakeholders, your customer representatives, your business analysts, your product managers and product owners are probably making bad decisions to some level because of these things outside of our control. The good news is that all your competitors are suffering from the same problem. So if you can figure out how to handle this stuff better, then you can start running circles around the competition. And that's why kind of this is so interesting. So in the book, Harford talks about three aspects of good plans that help successful organizations deal with uncertainty in these kind of dimensions. And he calls it the Palczynski principles after a guy called Piotr Palczynski, who invented the Lean Startup about 130 years ago and at the end got killed by the KGB for telling Stalin that his ideas were stupid. Um, so the first principle he talks about is the principle of variation, because we really don't know um, what's going to work out and what not. We need to have reserve ideas in the plan. We need to have variation in our plans. If we have a problem to solve, we need to have three or four potential solutions and then figure out which one of them is going to work. Just having one idea is not enough for good plans. The, the, the second thing is kind of these ideas should be survivable. Um, if one of them turns out to be bad, it shouldn't kind of completely derail what we do. And if you look at what's happened in the software industry over the last 20 years, we've kind of adopted this stuff. We've adopted the idea that hey, we might have alternative ways of solving the problem. We can iterate on it. We don't have to kind of buy into a single idea a long time ago, you know, a long time up front. And we're getting into stuff that's a lot more survivable. In theory, if we can measure the value of one iteration or two iterations, we can stop ourselves before spending 75 million pounds on something that delivers no value. But the reason why people don't really benefit from survivability and variation is Palczynski principle number three. So Palczynski principle number three is selection. No, not selection in terms of prioritization. Selection in terms of evolutionary Darwinistic selection. After we've taken something to production, what should survive and what should be killed off? Um, and this is an interesting question for you. Like, think about... Out of the stuff you've done last year, how many things have you removed from production after it was delivered? And if you're like most teams out there, the answer is zero. And now think about, are 
your business analysts are your product owners and your product managers and business stakeholders really so good that they make no mistakes? And probably not. Now, if you look at kind of variation and survivability, kind of we had that with roadmaps for a long time and, and things like that. But once we started getting devices like this, and once we started getting turn by turn navigation, that really brought selection. That brought the criteria that I know how to keep driving or move somewhere else during the drive. And that's kind of the stuff we need to have for our software. Those are the metrics that are the leading metrics, not whether we've arrived at the goal or not, but kind of, are we going the right direction? And this is kind of going back now, let's start solving the problem finally. What are good measurements? Now, Doug Hubbard in How to Measure Anything talks that good measurements typically help reduce uncertainty about something important. And they help us make an important decision. Now, reduce uncertainty, not necessarily remove. If they can help us reduce uncertainty, that's good. And finally, kind of uh, uh, in Lean Analytics, Joskovic and Kroll talk about how good measurements are usually ratios. They usually describe a change, something over something else, something divided by something else. Now, we're going to go back to the story I showed you, and we're going to look at, are we going in the right direction? Because that's the key question we need to answer. Doug Hubbard says, we need to be able to reduce uncertainty about an important decision. And this is the question we need to answer. For week after week, we need to know, are we going in the right direction? Should we remove what we've done? Should we extend it? Should we go in a different direction? And the big question is, if you look at something like this, and I deliver a mobile app, would you even be able to tell, are we going in the right direction? Where is the direction here? This is a statement. There is no direction here. And, and we can't know if we're going the right direction or not. So kind of in four disciplines of execution, they have two types of short-term value. They talk about how successful organizations have two ways of describing value on a short-term using leading indicators. One is to unblock or complete the critical task. Like if we're aiming for GDPR compliance, completing encryption for data is important. That, that's unblocking this stuff. Um, that kind of stuff is relatively rare because it's usually driven by external factors, external legislation, and kind of we look at this stuff. And you've talked about you know value be, be less miscategorized payments. Maybe that, that's what Lucas said. Let's look at this. So. Clearly, there's the, the, the value statement is somewhere here. But the big problem is, as I said, there is no direction. And the way you can put direction on this is you can ask how differently will we be detecting miscategorized payments after we built these alerting systems? And somebody suggested that, you know, fewer miscategorized payments. So we might detect them, we might detect more of them. But that might or might not be true. Um, this is actually based on a story I worked with with a client, and we ended up saying that the value is detecting payments faster. They detect all the miscategorized payments, but it takes them a long time to do it. And the value is in getting that faster. But now we have a direction we know we can, we can measure whether we're going the right direction or not. I can deliver some software. I can figure out if this is going or not. Now, once you have something like this, there's a potential second step is to say, well, how much faster does this need to be to be valuable? Like, if I do this 1% faster, does it justify a week of work? If I do 1% faster, does it justify a month of work or a year of work? Like how much faster is faster? And kind of, you know, if we can put a number there, that's amazing because we can say, well, we need to be 30% faster than what we are now. And then we can come up with ideas to solve it and we can figure out, are we going the right direction? Behavior changes as a measurement of value are absolutely amazing because once we start planning with, you know, somebody will do something differently, we're describing a problem. We're not describing a solution. And then when we can deliver a user story, we can actually measure whether the solution is solving the problem. 
And behavior changes are an amazing measurement of that because we can use them on a shorter time scale. We can deliver some software and measure with a smaller group of people. Even if we can't release to everybody, we can measure with five example users. Even if we can't do things perfectly, we can satisfy a smaller subgroup. Maybe to give something, you know, to, to give uh, this uh, error detection thing globally to all users, it's gonna take three months, but we can do the Polish data sources in one week. So let's do that first and measure whether our Polish account managers are detecting uh, the miscategorized payments faster. And there's lots and lots of kind of benefits to this, but one of the really interesting benefits is it helps us create this kind of middle level between top level goals, like, oh, we want to more revenue or protect uh, payments or whatever, and kind of software, the stuff we're doing, it, it helps us create this level in between where we can put lots of ideas, we have variation, and then we can say, well, we've delivered these epics, are they contributing to the kind of business change we wanted to happen? If yes, good. If not, well, maybe not so good. And if we go that way and create like 30% faster, imagine I had 20 epics about this thing. And for some weird reason, something unexpected happens and our first epic gets us there 30% faster. We no longer need to deliver the other nine, you know, 29. We, we are done. We, we've achieved what we wanted. So kind of, I tend to use a planning technique now. This is something I've discovered uh, in Sweden uh, at a conference, and I, I love it to kind of turn this funnel uh, upside down on the side. And um, it kind of helps us connect deliverables over behavior changes, over whose behavior we're changing, and goals, and this is a wonderful way to describe backlogs where we can actually start delivering something here and then measure whether it's contributing to what it needs to contribute. And we can also visualize our assumptions on a higher level and figure out, are we actually going the right direction? So if you're kind of interested in this topic, there's two takeaways. The first takeaway is for the next story you do, this is something you can apply now. Make sure it has a behavior change described. Don't be satisfied with the behavior or the type of work. Most stories have that. Figure out what is the intended change and is your assumption the same as the assumption of the stakeholders? And the second thing that's kind of a bit more difficult to apply is start thinking about hierarchical backlogs where you can actually have deliverables put in context of value. This is one type of backlog, it's not the only one, but if you can do that, then it allows you to kind of provide almost like a GPS for your software. This becomes a map, and then you can measure the next turn and figure out where you want to go. So kind of, here's a couple of links for you to uh, kind of finish this for today. Um, there's uh, impactmapping.org has a lot more information about this planning technique and uh, supporting kind of ideas. There's lots of community videos and, and stuff like that. Go and look at that. The slides have already been published. You can download them from this link. I'm pretty sure the organizers are gonna share them. And I'm coming to uh, Warsaw in uh, September and November to run some workshops on this stuff. So if you're interested in this topic, you can use Agile Wroclaw as a code for a 10% discount with Procognita. Go to Procognita PL, find these workshops, and um, um, you, know, you can save some money by using the Agile Wroclaw discount. Thank you very much. I, I can take questions now. I hope this was interesting. Thank you very much, Goiko. Very interesting. Um, so uh, once again, please look at the link for Treesider. There, uh, you can put some questions there. If you're already leaving, please leave, uh, leave feedback for us and for Goiko. Uh, the usual survey is there. And uh, let me have a look at the questions. So, so far we have two, not so much, expect, expecting more, but first question, if we focus on what we think contributes, example, reduce time to get the, to the doctor, to the bigger milestone, example, revenue, is it possible to link that? Uh, so I think there should be a clear link from uh, behavior changes to kind of the larger business goals. If you cannot justify that link, then somebody's lying. So that, that's why I like hierarchical backlogs like this one, because we have this kind of whole level here that says this is like the short-term value, this is the long-term value. And if this connection isn't logical, then the impact doesn't belong to that goal. It might belong to some other goal. 
and it might belong to some other roadmap, a different milestone of the product, but it might not belong to this particular milestone. And this is kind of where we, we I think, if you look at uh, better, you know, closer appointments to doctors, that, that's not necessarily more revenue. That's a better service because the doctors might get paid a fixed salary and, and things like that. Um, or the insurance company might be wanting this and the insurance company might actually get more revenue. It just, it really depends who the stakeholder is for this. But so in this case, it was kind of the doctor's association really wanting to uh, provide more value to the community and, and have happier, happier people basically uh, getting there sooner. It wasn't really about the revenue. It was about, if you really want to put it as a buzzword, customer satisfaction. But um, the, the um, yes, in a sense, you, there should be a clear link between um, short-term and long-term value. And if that's not obvious, then it's time to replan or at least challenge that. Thank you. Uh, next question. Someone asks about your book. Uh, mm. Someone says that uh, they've heard about this book in 2017. So they ask, how is it going? Yeah, it's, it's, it's going well. We're doing uh, lots of case studies and we've moved to the phase where we've done enough case studies to think we have solid patterns. But now we want to actually prove that these things are patterns and not something that we've invented by interviewing a, a relatively small group of people. So we want to prove that it's statistically relevant. And, um, and, you know, Corona kind of derailed us a bit for that. We were going to do a lot more interviews. Um, we are now trying to kind of collect, we, we have a good set of questions to try to collect people's experiences in um, kind of online survey. And um, we're kind of targeting almost anybody who's used impact mapping to fill in a survey. Um, so if you have done that, uh, if you've used impact mapping, you have good experiences, bad experiences, or kind of just my experiences, please do send me an email to, to goiko at goiko.com and I'll send you the link to fill in the survey. More data is always good. Thank you. Uh, next question. Um... From your experience, what are some examples of leading indicators, leading metrics for uh, measuring value that a Scrum team could use? Uh, so the, the best thing I can give you that, that is close to a universal tool is a behavior change for the user. So okay. um, in, in four disciplines of execution, they talk about two types of mention that uh, it's kind of completing a critical task or unblocking a critical blocker. But these things happen relatively rarely. Changing the behavior of a user to do something better, faster, cheaper, easier, uh, with more accuracy, with more fun, with um, kind of less effort or something like that, those are really good indicators of short-term value. Because what we can do then is if you have that defined, we can start looking at slicing of this area here not by slicing the stories, but by slicing the problem. Once you have a statement like that, two more options for slicing open up that are much better. First of all, I mentioned you can slice the actor segment. Don't solve the problem for everybody. Solve it for a smaller group that doesn't have some specific constraints. Like solve it for people who are outside the European Union first. You don't have to deal with GDPR. Prove it that this solves the problem, then do GDPR support. Or solve it for people in Poland. You don't have to translate it. Or so, so, you know, slice the actor. The other thing is slice the impact. If we want to get something 30% faster, well, getting it 3% faster is still valuable. It's not the end game, but it's valuable. And we can release something that goes 3% faster, measure, prove that this is going the right direction, and then keep continuing it. Otherwise, if we, you know, do some stuff here, we thought it's going to be 3% faster, but it's actually not. Uh, maybe it's time to replan. Maybe it's time to kind of pull some things out. So behavior changes are, are kind of the closest thing to a, a good measurement for leading indicators I found in, in software projects. And if you look at the stories I've given you, like M Mark Schwartz's team measured how many cases a human case worker can process per day. They were measuring a behavior change. Are they processing more cases per day? 
uh, for 40 Shades of Blue, they were measuring, are people clicking more on the links we showed them? They were measuring a behavior change. You know, to, to the best of my knowledge, these two groups did not use impact mapping, but, but they used, um, or actually, I think Mark did use impact mapping, but Google didn't. So the, the, uh, they, they use this idea of a behavior change as a short-term value. That's why I said you can do this even if you, you know, like are stuck in a, in a product or, or, a, or a kind of customer environment where they don't want to try any new ideas. Just make sure that every story has a behavior change defined. You don't even have to put a number on it. If you can put a number on it, amazingly better. But a behavior change gives you a direction. Once we know, is it supposed to be faster or cheaper or more accurate? We, we can measure whether we go in the right direction. Without the direction, it's impossible to know that. Thank you. Um, next question. Okay, so you kind of started already on this. Uh, so how can we... Um, start challenging management, product owners, etc. It might be difficult to get their attention and convince them that it might be worth their time uh, to rethink some ideas or plans. Uh, well, um, the, the best thing you can do is prove that some idea wasn't a good idea. Like what the people at Google did, you know, somebody important says, this is a brilliant idea. Here's, you know, the definition of value. Go and measure whether it's actually delivering value or not. And don't, don't, don't do this in an antagonistic way, like, ah, you're stupid, you know, this was a bad idea. But approach this from a perspective, like, is there one of these kind of unknown, unknowns there? You know, did we get misled because it's a different location, kind of, you know, time passed since we had this information? Or is it kind of that, you know, humans are tricking us? Maybe, you know, with the best intentions, People who need to make these decisions sometimes make bad decisions. And, and that's a fact of life. That's not a horrible situation, but knowing that this happened allows us to do the next cycle better. And uh, I think we can have another question, at least one. Okay, so uh, it's a long one. So... Um, do you have any tips from, uh, for spotting teams that are good at this? The reason I ask is... Wait, 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 wait. Okay, let's mute. Okay. Uh, so... So uh, the question... Yeah, humans are unpredictable, you know. <laughs> Um, the reason I ask is uh, many software teams might have to choose software vendors to help them. Normally, you can't incrementally implement implementations of vendors, so pick the right one that will prove provide better value over time means picking the team better at defining value. So it, I guess the, the question is about, you know, uh, getting the right uh, suppliers, the uh, vendors with the software. Sometimes you don't know if they... Well, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I think this is a completely orthogonal question here. You know, that's to deal with how much people, how, how good people are at sales and, and things like that. But I think um, if you can make, uh, if you can uh, somehow position your uh, agreement with the suppliers in terms of uh, th that you have a chance to measure the value or, or define the value together, they, they don't have they don't have to be the ones defining this. If you're on the customer side, you can get involved in defining this and you should, even better. You should own this definition of value. And understanding what behavior changes you want to cause might help the vendor figure out what software to build. And I think that, that, that's a more healthier relationship where um, usually I was on the kind of vendor side and I had to fight to extract this information. But if you are on the customer side and you can provide this information up front, that's incredibly valuable. And um, don't, don't get misled. One of the most important things is not to get misled by measuring effort. There's a wonderful paper for whoever asked this question, Google for why FBI cannot deliver a case management system. Um, and it explains a very kind of difficult relationship between a client organization that got tricked by a software vendor to measure function points. 
as, as a measurement of progress. And then everything was okay, everything was okay, everything was okay until it really wasn't. So kind of, you need to have some metrics for delivery and if you can position it to be more value-based, um, even if you have to pay them for lines of code or, or story points or complexity, um, measuring value and giving yourself the chance to um, replan and reorganize based on how much value was delivered is, is really, really important. And if you can choose a vendor that will work with you like that, I think that's already a big win. All right. So it's already 7 p.m. Uh, so I guess that's, uh, that's that. Mm. Hey, there is one more question. From one more question? There, there, yeah. There's always one Sebastian, more. would you like to unmute yourself and ask? Um, yeah, 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 oh, yeah. Great. Uh, Goiko, I love your work. It's great honor oh, to you, you know to, to to talk to you. I I'm great, always greatly inspired. Sorry, I'm quite nervous. <laughs> uh, so uh, I used impact mapping with departments that work in traditional way, and uh, it's always you know a, a pain for them to to like you know that's probably most of my fault but uh, you know to like use the impact mapping you need to invest some hours uh, you know the impact mapping is simple but uh, but difficult to like uh, use so maybe you can share some tips about like uh, using impact mapping in not that favorable uh, you know environments like for for example hrs finance uh, or uh, etc so I, I, my suggestion in situations like that is to find stakeholders who actually are decision makers and uh, whose budget you're spending. Uh, in organizations like that, that probably is cutting through several levels of hierarchy. If you can talk to people like that, impact mapping can help you. If you can't talk to people like that, impact mapping is just not going to help you because that's gonna be your proposal of value, but it might not map what these people want. So instead of doing impact mapping straight away in, in a situation like that, I would suggest doing the other thing I proposed where just for every ticket, every Jira item, every story, every whatever, make sure it has a clear behavior change on it. And usually you don't need to change your process much because you don't need to explain it that much. There's a refinement session anyway, you know, or, or, or a clarification session or somebody's writing some requirements there. You can just say, I, I usually, you know, I, I play the stupid card. I'll say, look, I, maybe I'm stupid, but can, can you help me understand what's so important about this? And then, you know, they feel powerful and, and, and good for explaining to a stupid developer what's going on. Um, and then try to take the discussion in the direction of a behavior change. Now, you can do this in two ways. You can, you can actually ask like, what's the right behavior change for this? But that might not be good for people that are not kind of used to this. Or you can propose your own behavior change. That, that's why I love somebody pasting in the chat while I was talking, kind of detecting more of these problem, problem things. As soon as you propose something, there's something to argue about. And, and my big lesson working with stakeholders, and I stole this, I, I, I stole this from at least three different places. I don't know who stole it from each other, but le let's say that I stole this from Michael Bolton. Um, so it, it's much, 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 much easier for people to complain than to tell you what they want. So give them something to complain about. Say, look, I think what you're telling me is we need to build these things so that people detect mispayments, uh, more mispayments. Is that right? And then you're either going to get a yes, and then you can talk about, well, how much more is more? Or somebody's going to say, well, not really more. I mean, we're detecting all of them. More is not the problem. But then you can say, okay, what is the problem? And, and you can start talking about that. So the, the, I, I wouldn't try to explain what I'm doing too much um, when working with business stakeholders because they really shouldn't care that much about it. What they care about is that you understood their value. I've done, so, uh, you know, I like done something similar. So, you know, like simplify, uh, simplify the impact maps 
to like uh, like four columns that are not that uh, direct and one of them was the, the behavior part yeah and the great I, I very like the tip about you know guessing the behavior yeah I'm very grateful so thank you for and your yeah just reply. just this just make sure you don't stop on the behavior a behavior is a starting point for discussion yeah, yeah. unless you get to a change in that behavior there will not be a direction to measure mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. All right. Good. Oh. Thank you very much for, for spending an hour of your life with me. Um, <laughs> the, the, if you do have some interesting stories about impact mapping and you'd like to share them with, with us for the book, please just uh, drop me a note. I'm very easy to find online. Like if you Google for Goiko, there's basically this uh, footballer in Germany who's sleeping with supermodels. He comes out first. That's not me, unfortunately. Then there's a, there's a guy called Goiko who used to play... Uh, American Indians in East German movies in the 70s. That's not me as well. And I, I'm the third one. So uh, it's very easy to find online. Um, drop me an email and we'll be in touch. Thank you very much.